Well, what we also always have to do is find uh, the right balance between not hurting our economy too right. much, because this is the strongest leverage we have mm -hmm. against uh, this Russian aggression, Putin's aggression. Um, and f I take the example of oil. Mm -hmm. Where we have to be careful is that if we would completely cut immediately, as of today, um, off the oil, he might be able to take the oil that he does not sell to the European Union to the world market, where the prices will increase, mm -hmm. and sell it for more, and thus fill his war chest. So we have to be uh, very strategic in the way we approach that topic, and um, therefore it is also so important that we convene the rest of the world mm -hmm. to really make sure that we that we deplete his war chest. So a full embargo embargo would really be years away. Over time, over time, what we do is get rid of the overall dependency of Russian fossil fuels, yeah. all three of them, and never to go back. Good morning from Athens, Greece. It is eight o'clock here on this Monday morning from the capital of the Hellenic Republic. We have got a lot of news to talk about. The first story is Elensky's trip to the front lines in Kharkov. The next story is a Guardian article discussing the connection between Putin and Trump and this uh, special military operation. And then we're going to talk about Ursula van der Leyen and her push for some sort of oil embargo and also clown world which has to deal with Ursula van der Crazy as well so let's get into it and let's talk about Ukraine president Alodomir Elensky and his trip to the northeast front lines of Kharkov and uh, Elensky got dressed up in his his vest and his military gear and he was escorted by a large military entourage to the front lines in Kharkov. This is his first trip outside of Kiev since February 24th, if you believe that. <laughs> I think he, might have, he may have made a couple of trips to Poland, but anyway, um, supposedly, allegedly, this is his first trip outside of Kiev, and uh, he went to visit areas outside of Kharkov, and uh, he was shown around the area and uh, he was shown all the all the damaged buildings and he gave some uh, words of encouragement to the ukraine military that is fighting on the front lines he said you risk your lives for us all and for our country in this war the occupiers are trying to squeeze out at least some result but they should have understood long ago that we will defend our land to the last man. They have no chance. We will fight and we will definitely win. So those were the words of encouragement from Alensky as he was visiting the front lines. Keep in mind that if you buy into the uh, Collective West mainstream media narrative and the, uh, the Ukraine Ministry of Defense, if you, if you believe what they were telling us a week ago, this area was the scene of the uh, the siege of Kharkov, and this is where Ukraine, the Ukraine military, mounted uh, an amazing counteroffensive to beat back the advancing Russian forces, and to uh, go all the way to the Russian Federation border. There was even a video of Ukraine military with a border carrying a border uh, signpost and going to uh, to the Russian border and planting that signpost and uh, sending a telegram video back to Olensky saying, we made it, we made it all the way to the Russian Federation. So a week ago, this was the scene of, uh, if you believe the collective West, of heavy battles and a major offensive from, uh, from Ukraine. And uh, now you have the Ukraine president visiting the front lines. The reality of the situation is that uh, the Russians were just uh, keeping the Ukraine military occupied. They were keeping them pinned down uh, in a freezing operation so that that Ukraine military in the northeast of Kharkov would not be uh, sent down to the Donbass where the Russian military is carrying out the real uh, operation. Phase two, the real work that needs to be carried out in the Donbass. So, it was maneuver warfare. The Russians were allowing the Ukraine military to move in and out of certain villages. The, uh, the Russians were keeping them pinned down and you saw the results of that successful pinning operation in the Northeast with the uh, stunning advancements of the Russian military 
in the Donbass, specifically Papaznaya and uh, Severodonetsk, and now this uh, this encirclement of around 16,000 Ukraine uh, military in uh, North Lugansk. So that pinning operation in Kharkov was very successful, and it allowed the Russians to to break uh, very very fortified front lines of uh, of the Ukraine military in Donbas. But Alensky, he needs PR points, so he went to the outskirts of uh, of Kharkov, and uh, he made the statements in order to to bring back some some media attention to Ukraine and uh, to to what's happening in uh, in the uh, in the fight with Russia with Russia. And uh, he, he's done this before, you know. I, I remember in 2017. Or was it 2018? Alensky got uh, dressed up in military gear and he went to the front lines and uh, he took some photos. And those photos really, they, they got a lot of traction. They were even used during the first month of special operations, of the special military operation. These photos were used by the collective West in order to, uh, to spread the false narrative, the fake news that Alensky was actually in the uh in the fights with uh with the russians in uh in the east of ukraine and that was completely false my point is is that those uh those photos they got a lot of use i'm sure that alensky and his team of script writers and directors and producers they said you know what let's go to Kharkov because there really is no siege of Kharkov. there never was a siege of Kharkov. that's why alensky could go there and uh let's go there and take some photos and uh, give them to our um, to our friends in the collective West and the mainstream media, so that they could spread the narrative that you are the brave, fearless leader who will go to the front lines in order to provide a morale boost to the Ukraine troops. And that is exactly what the collective West media did. The stories were running that uh, Alensky is a heroic figure. He's going to uh, to the front lines. He's going to, to where the danger is, where the action is, in order to provide that morale boost to the uh, to the Ukraine soldiers who are fighting the Russians. Interestingly enough, <laughs> those uh, that trip in 2017, 2018 to the front lines, where Alensky got dressed up with uh, with the military gear. The story goes that Alensky went to the front lines in Donbas. And uh, when the Azov NAZI saw him, they actually made fun of him and they ridiculed him. And uh, the story says that they made, they, they made so much fun of Ilensky that he had to kind of leave uh, the area almost in tears because the NAZIs were poking so much fun of him, at, at him. They were telling him, get the hell out of here, Ilensky, <laughs> leave us alone. You're not our president. And this is documented. Like, I'm not making this up. This is documented that the Azov NAZIs were actually making fun of Alensky, telling him, you're not our leader, you're not our commander-in-chief, get the hell out of here, you uh, you chump, <laughs> you actor, you clown. And they were actually telling him this, and he, he left almost in tears. But um, anyway, he got his, uh, his media PR points from this visit. Let's move on to some more uh, media fake news. And that has to deal with a Guardian article that uh, Alexander brought to, to my attention. And he did a great video on this. Uh, it's up, it was up last night. So I will put a link to that video, you can find it. So you can find it and listen to what Alexander has to say about it. It deals with an article written by uh, Simon, Simon Tisdale, I believe from The Guardian. And I'm not going to uh, read any excerpts from it. I'm not gonna, I, I just can't. I can't read any excerpts from it because it's so ridiculous. Alexander actually, he goes into uh, more detail with regards to this uh, article from The Guardian. And I even think he had a hard time. He was struggling reading some of the excerpts from this article by Mr. Tisdell. Yes, Simon Tisdell. The title of the article is The Donald and the Kremlin Don, How Trump's Toxic Legacy Helps Putin. And basically, this article from The Guardian is uh, important because I think it shows the, the amount of, uh, of coping that the collective West is now starting to, uh, to engage in. 
and how the media is going to deal with the reality of what's happening in Ukraine, i.e. the fact that after three months of telling everybody that the Russians are losing and Ukraine is winning and they're winning big, the truth of the matter is that the Russians are winning big and the Alensky regime and the entire Ukraine project that the collective West embarked on, and it's not only a military project, it's an economic and a media project, it's falling apart in spectacular fashion. And uh, the mainstream media is trying to cope with, uh, with this narrative breakdown, this massive narrative breakdown. And you can see the hamsters in their head the hamster wheels are turning and they're trying to figure out a way to uh, to explain uh, how all of this this run this Russian winning is happening. How have the Russians come to win so much and so big in what they believe is is overnight a matter of, of days because they were led to believe that over three months the uh, the Putin government was going to collapse, Ukraine was going to take Crimea, and it was all going to be over. But um, one of the ways they're coping is by blaming it on Trump. <laughs> yeah, that's what they're going to do. When in doubt, blame it on Trump. When in doubt, blame it on Putin. Putin, Trump, Trump, Putin. Putin did it, Trump did it, Trump did it, Putin did it. So this article from The Guardian actually says that uh, the special military operation was a big plot, a big plan hatched by Putin and Trump. Trump is to blame for what's happening in Ukraine because Trump was to blame for what happened in Afghanistan. It's an incredible uh, article, an incredible amount of coping, and it shows how the mainstream media, they've got some serious, like, mental problems. <laughs> I mean, they need help. They need psychological help. And when and when the Alensky, uh, the, the Ukraine project completely collapses, I, I, I think a lot of these people are going to need to check themselves in. But um, the article says that it was Trump to blame for Afghanistan. He was the one that uh, sabotaged Joe Biden in, uh, in Afghanistan that led to the disaster there. Because if it wasn't for Trump, then, uh, then the Biden administration would have had everything under control in Afghanistan. And uh, the Taliban would not be so emboldened because they were emboldened by Trump for some reason. And uh, you wouldn't have had the results that you had in Afghanistan. And uh, that sabotaged Joe Biden. And now Trump is uh, kind of working with Putin to sabotage Biden in Ukraine and to lead to a Russian victory. That is, in a nutshell, the summary of this article. And uh, it is Putin and Trump that are kind of working together you know, in this not so official way, maybe because Putin is like the puppet master of everybody, so he's puppeteering Trump. But uh, it's uh, it's Putin and Trump now that are working together to to lead to a Russian victory in Ukraine, so that the Republicans win in uh, the midterms in 2022, November of 2022, and so that they pave the way for uh, Trump return to the White House and a victory in 2024. That's the only way that uh, they, will, they will be able to unseat and defeat Joe Biden because according to this article, Joe Biden is the most capable, strongest, most popular president in American history, 81 million votes. And he had everything under control if it wasn't for this alliance between uh, Trump and Putin. So you are seeing Putin help Trump to win the White House and you're seeing Trump helping Putin to uh, defeat Ukraine. <laughs> this, is, this is how The Guardian is going to explain away the three months of lies and how they're going to explain away the, uh, the collapse of the, the Ukraine project. <laughs> blame it on Trump. Blame it on Putin. Not blame it on Trump. No, let's blame it on Putin. <laughs> what did these guys do? Who did they blame things on before Trump and Putin? That would be an interesting question to ask the uh, the writers at The Guardian. And when did The Guardian become such a bad publication? I remember growing up, The Guardian was considered to be a pretty good uh, newspaper. Newspaper. <laughs> Not like an online uh, tabloid. But it was considered to be, you know, a liberal left, respectable newspaper, I guess. I mean, I don't know. People in the UK, let me know. 
But boy, has the Guardian tur turned into a fake news online publication. I mean, really, really bad stuff. But I wonder what these guys were doing before uh, Trump and Putin. Who were they blaming things on? And who are they going to blame things on after Trump and Putin? <laughs> Everything is Trump's fault. Everything is Putin's fault. So, yeah, these guys are really coping hard. And it's going to get a lot, lot worse when the thing really collapses and um, the mainstream media will not be able to hide anything because the truth is coming out. But they're still trying to hide certain things like Elensky going to the front lines, supposedly going to the front lines in Kharkov and uh, providing a morale boost to the Ukraine military. So, you know, they're trying to cover up some, uh, some things, but when it all comes crashing down, like all of it, it's gonna be really, really difficult for them to, uh, to cope. <laughs> it's gonna be really difficult for the mainstream media and the collective West to deal with it. But anyway, let's move on to the final two stories and they both deal with Ursula van der Crazy and uh, they deal with the, uh, the oil embargo against Russia and um, one is a real story. One is also, the second one is also a real story, but it's a clown world story, and it deals with Ursula van der Leyen in both of these uh, segments. By the way, an update on uh, the Iran-Greece incident, because that deals with oil as well. Uh, the last I heard is that the Iranians have, um, they've moved the, uh, the, Greek car the Greek oil tanker that they seized, the two Greek oil tankers that they seized, Greeks, Greece, seized one oil tanker iran uh reciprocated by seizing two and they moved the tanker to the bandar abbas uh port the southern coast of iran and iranian iranian officials came out with a statement and they said the crew of the two greek tankers have not been arrested and all crew members are in good health and are being protected and provided with necessary services while on board in accordance with international law that's a statement from iran's port and maritime organization so the ships have been moved and Iran came out with a statement saying that the crew members are fine and are in good health and they have not been arrested or detained and they're being taken care of. And that's the last update I have, the latest update I have with regards to this incident. I will say this though, Greece, we are not very good pirates. <laughs> we are not very good pirates at all because we seized, um, we seized an oil tanker at the behest of the United States. The US told us to seize this oil tanker. And uh, in this act of piracy, we ended up just giving the oil to the United States. That's just some bad piracy. At least as pirates, you would imagine that uh, you would seize the contents of the ship and uh, you would either take that content and use it for your own uh, gain or you would sell it to the United States so at the very least, being good pirates, you'd imagine that the Greeks would take that oil and sell it to the U.S., but now they just gave it to the U.S. <laughs> what a bunch of bad pirates we are. <laughs> anyway, um, that's the update coming from that story. Now let's talk about Ursula van der Crazy, and uh, let's discuss the EU oil embargo. We're going to have an EU meeting today and tomorrow, a commission, EU commission meeting with the ambassadors and they are going to the ambassadors of the EU. You know, it sounds like all these names that they give the EU, uh, Brussels infrastructure, like the whole architecture of it, the EU ambassadors and the commissioner and all this stuff, it does sound like something out of Star Wars, something out of the, uh, the empire. So anyway, the EU ambassadors are gonna be meeting with the EU commission. <laughs> it really does sound uh, like the empire. And they're going to finally decide on a way to embargo Russian oil. And Ursula van der Leyen, she really, really wants this bad. I mean, she wants this PR win. She wants to get in front of the podium at EU headquarters. And she wants to tell the entire world that uh, she has finally placed an oil embargo on Russia. And she has... Um, she has struck another fatal blow to the Putin war machine. She's dying to, uh, to give that speech. And so 
she's trying to figure out a way now to get hungry on board on side because Hungary is the one country that is taking a very firm uh, stance against the uh, the oil embargo because well Hungary's landlocked and they rely on uh, on Russian pipeline oil and uh, and they're saying no if you place this embargo on us you know we're we're screwed they've actually said this is going to be like an atomic bomb on our economy and so Ursula believes that she may have fi figured out a way to uh, to make her triumphant speech to get the oil embargo while pleasing uh, Hungary and uh, the way they're going to do it is by placing uh, some uh, some waivers to the uh, to the embargo by giving uh, some flexibility as to how the embargo the oil embargo is going to work the EU's executive arm says shipments of oil through the Druzba pipeline which connects Russia to Ukraine Belarus Poland Hungary Slovakia the Czech Republic Austria and Germany should for now be spared from the embargo that the bloc is looking to impose on Moscow over its military offensive against Ukraine so that's going to be the flexibility that's going to be the the workaround that uh, Ursula van der van der crazy is going to to put on the table either today or tomorrow basically the uh, Druzba pipeline which I actually mentioned in a video a couple of days ago the pipeline that runs from uh, from Russia through through Ukraine and into um, into Europe through Belarus Russia it runs it's a big pipeline it's a massive pipeline pipeline it's the pipeline that feeds Hungary and many other countries as well that uh, that pipeline is going to be exempt for now from the oil embargo and it will allow the proposal is allegedly aimed at satisfying the objections of Hungary which has been stalling the sixth package of EU sanctions against Russia. Budapest receives most of its oil from Russia and has compared a full ban to an atomic bomb. Other landlocked nations, including the Czech Republic and Slovakia, have also voiced reservations over an embargo. The EU is going to give Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, countries that uh, rely on the Druzba pipeline, the EU is going to give them some time to figure out a way to, uh, to replace the Druzba pipeline and to wean themselves off of Russian oil. News flash to uh, the EU and to Ursula, uh, Hungary and Czech Republic and these countries that are, that, that are dependent on the Druza pipeline, they are not going to find a way to substitute pipeline oil in the next year or two. It's just not gonna happen. I mean, what are you gonna do? Build more pipelines from where? <laughs> Which country is gonna, is gonna be your pipeline that's going to replace the Druzba. So uh, that is the plan there to exempt this pipeline. But she also said that in order to get this oil embargo moving, they are going to uh, stop supplies from sea. Sea transport of oil is going to be stopped, but it's not gonna be stopped right away. Ursula and uh, her EU commission team they are going to allow countries to uh they're going to give countries eight months to find alternatives to russian oil that is transported via sea as for supplies by sea all eu states are to give up on russian crude delivered by tankers in six months and refined petroleum products in eight months the sources said the European Commission has also proposed restricting re-exports of Russian pipeline oil to other member states or third countries as part of the draft. So six to eight months is what uh, all other EU countries are going to have with regards to Russian oil transported by sea. Now, um, Greece is going to have an interesting time pitching this to uh, their oligarch shipping class but i imagine what greece is going to do over the next eight months is they're going to start to prepare the way for those oil tankers that uh, greece runs to to transport russian oil those oil tankers are going to start um, fixing paperwork changing up paperwork changing up administration company ownership 
uh, shipping flags. They're going to start to prepare the way, the infrastructure, so that the oil, the Russian oil that is uh, put on these tankers and delivered is, uh, is going to be laundered. It's going to be laundered oil. In other words, the Greek shippers are going to take this oil. They're going to make a couple of trips around the world. The flags of their ships are going to change. The owners of their ships are going to change. The administrative uh, paperwork is going to get uh, shuffled around. And eventually when this oil lands back in uh, Europe and is delivered to EU countries, keep in mind this is still Russian oil, this Russian oil will be laundered and uh, it's going to be delivered to EU countries at about 10 to 20 times more the price, the cost. Because, well, the ships had to, had to do all of these things. They had to make all of these trips and do all of this uh, junk in order to uh, deem this Russian oil as uh, laundered, to make it laundered and to make it not Russian oil. So pretend, it's, it's pretend. It's not Russian oil, really, it's not Russian oil. It is Russian oil, but let's pretend it's not because we made a couple of trips around, uh, around the world and changed some flags of the ship. So um, that's how they're gonna do a, a workaround for this, I imagine. The bad news is that uh, this is gonna end up costing everyone in Europe over the, the foreseeable future um, a lot more. In, uh, in gas and petrol and, and all of these things because the uh, Greek shippers and all the shippers, Cyprus, Malta, that are gonna have to go through this song and dance, well, they're gonna um, have to drive up all the prices and those prices are going to drive up all the costs. Those costs are gonna be uh, passed on to, to us. So that is the plan from Ursula van der Leyen. That is how she is going to get the oil embargo passed. Let's move on to Clown World. And this also deals with Ursula van der Crazy. And uh, she gave an interview to MSNBC about two, three days ago. And uh, in this interview, well, let me read you. Let me read you what she said. The European Commission President Ursula van der Leyen told MSNBC earlier this week that the bloc could not place an immediate ban on Russian oil as President Vladimir Putin, and this is a quote, might be able to take the oil that he does not sell to the EU to the world market, where the prices will increase and sell it for more, and that would fill his war chest. I can't believe a person this stupid is the, uh, the commissioner of the entire European Union. What a bunch of gaslighting BS from Ursula van der Crazy. Listen to what she is saying. She is saying that the EU has not been able to place an oil embargo on Russia yet because if they stopped buying Russian oil, then Putin would sell that Russian oil to other people at such a high price that it would uh, fill his war chest. So it's actually, the EU is actually buying Russian oil in order to make Russia poorer and in order to, uh, to stop Putin from making money and, uh, and filling up his, uh, his coffers. <laughs> oh my God, as if Putin wouldn't be able to, to sell that Russian oil elsewhere. He already is selling it elsewhere. He's selling it to India and China. India is filling up their petroleum reserves. Uh, China is filling up their petroleum reserves. India is... Um, is filling up their their oil reserves at, at, at record levels they actually had to stop maintenance on refineries because they they have so much russian oil coming in and uh the price of russia of oil and gas is skyrocketing and russia is already making tons of money i mean they, they've got more money that, that they know what to do with they've they're already making tons of money without this uh <laughs> this narrative that ursula van der Leyen is presenting or presented to MSNBC. Talk about copium. Talk about coping. <laughs> Man, <laughs> that is something. So that's Ursula van der Leyen explaining why the EU just simply can't, can't uh, embargo Russian oil just yet. They're going to do it, you know, they're going to phase it in because uh, if they did it now, well, then Putin would sell his, his oil elsewhere. Van der Leyen also said, over time, what we do is get rid of the overall dependency of the Russian fossil fuels. 
all three of them, and never go back again. If there's anything Putin has achieved, it is that he lost his best client and Europe will never go back. And he pushed us, and that's good, into the direction of renewable energy, she said. So that's what it's, it's all about for Ursula, for uh, Annalena Brabach, for Robert Habeck. For them, it's all about this uh, Green New Deal renewable energy fiction. And for them, if uh, EU citizens have to suffer for 10, 15 years with higher oil prices, higher gas prices, if uh, EU citizens have to freeze, if EU citizens have, uh, are unable to fill up their, uh, their gas tank, their car, if, they're, if they have to give up their car, if they have to choose between fuel and food for the Greens and for Ursula, it's worth it. Because in 10, 15, 20 years, they believe that they're gonna have their renewable energy Green New Deal dream. They're ideologues. They're ideologues in this green renewable energy dream is, uh, this is their religion. This is their religion. And they are uh, high priests and priestesses of the, of the religion. And so the ends justify the means for them. And that's what this is really all about. For them, it's about the, uh, the great reset and renewable energy. And if they have to do it by, uh, by lockdowns and coof and by sanctioning Russia, then so be it. That's how they're going to achieve their goal. But um, coming out and saying that uh, you haven't been able to put an oil embargo on Russia just yet because it would uh, push Russia to sell their oil elsewhere. Well, what a ridiculous statement. Russia's going to sell their oil. There's always going to be buyers of their oil. It's, uh, it's just a fact of life. And uh, the price of oil, Ursula, is already going up with or without the EU buying that oil. And it's going to continue to go up. And after the EU, today or tomorrow, if and when the EU, today or tomorrow, passes these, uh, these amended, these massaged uh, oil embargo sanctions on Russia, well, guess what? The price of oil is going to go up even more. And guess what? The Russians are going to find all kinds of people to buy that oil. All kinds of people. But I, I, I really think it's uh, interesting on a final note, how the EU is constantly saying that uh, Russia's losing their best client and without us, uh, Russia's going to collapse. Without us buying their oil, Russia's going to collapse and we're going to be the ones, the EU, we're going to be the ones that cut Russia off. I always find that interesting because you know what's going to happen? It's going to actually be the Russians that are going to cut the EU off. Just like they did with gas for rubles, they're going to put in place oil for rubles and what that is is the russians essentially telling the europeans you know what we don't need your business because we've got all kinds of buyers for our commodities and you saw that exactly play out with gas for rubles the russians didn't complain when uh when the european uh, countries like uh, poland and, and finland and slovakia and bulgaria came out with all these statements saying we will never buy russian gas we won't do it the Russians didn't get out there and whine and complain. They said, that's your business. You want to shoot yourself in, your, in the foot twice? Go ahead. It's not our problem. We're going to sell that gas elsewhere. They didn't complain. They didn't whine. They didn't do any of that stuff. And sure enough, after two, three weeks, the, uh, the EU, the companies in the European Union, ended up paying for gas in rubles. 40 plus companies, they all folded and they all paid for the gas in rubles. That's exactly what's gonna happen with oil. Exactly what's gonna happen. Come September, uh, October, the Russian government is gonna say, rubles for oil. The EU is going to complain for two, three weeks and gonna say, this is blackmail, this is energy blackmail, and how could the Russians do this, and blah, blah, blah. And then the EU is going to buy that oil for rubles. <laughs> that is what is gonna happen. And uh, that is the Russians. That's not the Europeans telling the Russians that we don't want your oil. That is Russia telling the Europeans, if you want our oil, these are our terms. If you don't want our oil, no problem. Go buy the oil elsewhere. We've got plenty of buyers. The Russians are not sitting in a room and they're 
and they're asking themselves, we've got all this oil, what do we do with it? Who is going to buy all this oil? That is not the questions that the Russians are asking. The Russians have plenty of people, plenty of buyers that want oil and need oil. Everyone, every country needs oil. And every country is going to look to buy oil and Russia has plenty of it with or without the EU. So the whole narrative that it's the EU that's going to cut Russia off is completely false. It's fake, fake news. Like uh, Elensky with his military outfit going to the front lines to um, provide a morale boost to the Ukraine troops. It's all fake news, narrative spin, because come September, come October, reality is going to hit and it's going to be the Russians who are going to tell the Europeans, if you want to buy commodities from us, we want rubles, period. And that is going to be the terms. There's going to be no, uh, there's going to be no negotiation with unfriendly countries, take it or leave it. So it's going to be the Russians who cut off the Europeans, not the Europeans cutting off the Russians, not the EU cutting off the Russians. While we're talking about Europeans, Serbia, by the way, has inked uh, a very nice energy deal with, uh, with Russia. And they've, uh, they haven't disclosed the terms of that deal, but because Serbia is a friendly nation, they, uh, they seem pretty happy. Vucic and uh, his team seemed pretty happy with the deal that they inked with uh, Russia, a gas contract to be more uh, precise a long-term gas contract. So when you're a friendly nation, you know, it has its benefits. When you're an unfriendly nation, you're just gonna have to pay for, uh, for the commodities in rubles. So that is the clown world. That is a fantastic clown world from uh, Ursula van der Crazy, where uh, <laughs> she made some interesting statements to MSNBC. Very inter interesting statements. We'll see today what happens with the uh, with this oil embargo as the uh, EU ambassadors and the commission meet. For now, I am siding off here from uh, Athens, Greece. Check out Alexander's channel and analysis. I'll put a link down below to his analysis of the Trump Putin Guardian story and check out the Duran and the videos that we are putting out on the Duran main channel. Also go to the Duran.locals.com. I am coming to you from downtown central Athens. Time for a coffee and time to get this video up. Take care. <music>